Tonight on Nate News Watch. We take a look at a pilot project for backyard beekeeping in the city. This past summer, they did a pilot project to investigate how they might change the bylaw, and we were part of that project. The National Organization for Dying with Dignity fights provincial and federal law. Essentially, this criminal code violates my right to life, liberty, and security of person. Newswatch starts now. Good evening. I'm Michaela Henschel. And I'm Ben Matichuk. With the election being yeah, called... Ben, ben, wait. Do you want to do the show a little bit differently tonight? Okay. I don't know. Let's, let's get casual. Yeah, okay. come on, Ben. Let's get casual. We don't have to do news the traditional way. You know what, actually? Let's leave the desk. Leave the desk? Yeah, come on. Let's go wherever the story takes us. The National Organization for Dying with Dignity has long been fighting for what it says is a Canadian's right to die. And the fight continues as the Supreme Court of Canada rules whether federal or provincial government will make that legislation. Taylor Petty has that story. It was almost 84% of Canadians who felt we deserved the right to choice at the end of life. Dying with Dignity informs people about their end-of-life options while offering tools for advanced care planning. They have a strong team of professionals that help support those at the end of their lives. Dying with Dignity is the national organization working to improve quality of dying and to expand end-of-life options in Canada. Physician-assisted suicide is to help those who are suffering due to a serious medical condition. In 1993, one of the most famous cases was Sue Rodriguez, and she said that essentially this criminal code violates my right to life, liberty, and security of person. Dying with dignity has not always been a choice of ours. The Supreme Court of Canada says it is now time. The government has up to a year to make legislation that will help those with physician-assisted suicide. Although some say that is just too long, for time is of the essence. My name is Barb Gibson Clifford. I'm 69 years old. And uh, my interest in dying with dignity became very poignant and very personal when I was diagnosed with a rare sarcoma, a cancer, in 2005. Barb. A kind, warm woman who I had the pleasure of meeting spoke to me about her battle with cancer and how she lives day to day. These are difficult to treat. They respond not well to most treatment me methodologies. And they have a terrible prognosis. So that's a good place to start. The numbers for survival are low. 10% survive beyond five years. Barb has faced obstacles throughout her 10-year fight. The price for that has been uh, multiple surgeries, 11 in nine years, most of them big ones, abdominal or lung. She spends her time on the acreage watching the birds at the feeder, enjoying the big deck overlooking the yard. I live my life one day at a time. There really is meaning to that phrase and I am so grateful that I have had 10 years. I've... The one-year restriction on the new law leaves Bob worried she may not get to utilize it that that is the biggest challenge that I face besides surviving the disease is surviving it long enough for that situation to happen. We never know. We just never know when things can happen, accidents happen, all kinds of awful things. Unfortunately, life is, life is terrifying and life is also exquisitely beautiful. Taylor Petty, Nate Newswatch Extra. Well, bees are friendlier than you think and they pollinate one third of the food we eat today prompting some Edmontonians to start backyard beekeeping. Dane Winter has more on that story. Whether they make you flinch or make you smile, bees are an important part of the ecosystem. In this local backyard, when the weather warms up and the sun shines, it's buzzing with activity. Jocelyn is a co-founder of Yeg Bees, a group promoting urban beekeeping in Edmonton and is part of a pilot project put on by the city. Before uh, last year, beekeeping was illegal and had been since the early 1980s. You weren't allowed to have them on residential zoned property. 
And then this past summer, they did a pilot project to investigate how they might change the bylaw, and we were part of that project. As the owner of one of three hives allowed on Edmonton residential properties, a set of guidelines has to be laid out. The current bylaw restricts you from having bees unless you receive a license issued by the city manager. The conditions include the location, the amount of bees, their housing, and training for proper care. You shouldn't ask yourself the question, do I want to keep bees? You should really actually ask yourself, can you keep bees? So for one, if you have an allergy, it's not a good idea. Another thing is you need to make sure you have a hive that can be placed in a good location. So if you don't have a backyard, then it's not a place that you can put bees. In Edmonton, there were more than 200 hives in operation illegally in people's backyards. And Jocelyn believes the new bylaw will allow people to share information more openly. For example, there are certain diseases bees can contract, such as the most common American fowl brood, which is highly contagious among them. When beekeeping is illegal and people have underground hives, there's not that network of support and information sharing that if you think you have a fowl brood infest infestation that you can't get help for it or advice in the same way that if it is legal and out in the open. The decision to make the changes to the bylaw was unanimously accepted by City Council and in turn one step closer to urban beekeeping within the city. And now that it is legal or will soon be legal, you need to make sure you follow all the requirements from the City of Edmonton. And so if you can do all of those things, then you can have a hive. By mid-April this year, City Council is expected to pass the amendments to the bylaw, meaning this summer, seeing beehives in backyards like this might not be an uncommon occurrence. Ding Winter, Nate News Watch Extra. Coming up after the break, we examine the effect oil prices have had on the Edmonton housing market. The expectation of culture on young people is at odds with housing prices. The city is trying to draw attention to 124th Street and its local businesses. I mean, personally, I, I love the independent nature of the street. Uh, it's one of the few areas of the city where it's not overwritten with chains and franchises and things like that. The Edmonton housing market seems to be in good shape despite the recent economic downturn in Alberta. But the houses might be a little too expensive for some new home buyers. Reed Walker has more. The average price of a home in Edmonton was around $362,000 this February, according to the Canadian Real Estate Association's National Price Map Average. But right now, it's risen up to $370,000 in only a few months. Tammy Savage has been a realtor for five years, and she says price increases like this are common for markets like Edmonton. Our market does it, it grows um, steadily as more so Vancouver is a much more volatile market, has a lot of ups and downs um, with it, where ours tends to be a much more slower progression in prices. A lot of that is driven by demand or people coming in from other parts of the country. Although prices in Edmonton are steady, it doesn't mean that they're convenient and affordable for everyone. So it just might take you a little bit longer to find that right place. Curtis was looking for his first house for six months. But after an unsuccessful search, he decided to just build his own. I started looking for a house in about the spring of 2013, um, just very slowly starting to, you know, use whatever resources I could find in order to look at houses. So whether that be on the web or um, the classifieds, etc. Did a few walkthroughs, started working with a realtor, started visiting some show homes and ultimately decided to build a house because I wasn't finding anything that was both within my price range and had the features that I wanted. Even though Edmonton had just over 3,000 new listings in March alone, it's not always a quick find to get the house that you want and also have it be within your price limit. Despite the large number of houses available, the one you might be able to afford could be in a neighborhood that's far from a mall or your place of work. So for some new home buyers expecting to search for a few months right after graduating college could be in for a surprise when you can't find that perfect house right away. It almost seems like the expectation of culture on young people is at odds with housing prices because um, if one follows the ex expected path that's set before you where out of high school, you're either you know what you want to do or you know what school you want to go to and then you go to post-secondary and you end up with 
student loans and during that time you've only been working part time, it would take a, it takes a really, really long time to actually be able to afford a house. Reed Walker, Nate Newswatch Extra. I can't seem to get my robot down. But robotic technology has slowly been making more of an impact with big steps in artificial intelligence. Not to mention prosthesis, with scientists making advancements in arms, hands, feet, and even legs. Ben has more. When it comes to technology, the progress that's been made with robots is largely undefined. We see them in movies being exalted to the point of intelligence where they can perform a human's job as well or better than a human. But how far have they come in reality? Patrick Polarski, an assistant professor with the Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Alberta, says the state of robot technology is a cornerstone of modern prosthetics. So this is a uh, robotic prosthetic hand that you may actually see someone walking around on the street with. You may shake hands with someone wearing this hand. Uh, this system is a electromechanical device. So it uses uh, signals from the human body, the, the non amputated part of their body, and it can move, especially in response to the needs of the amputee using it. Despite the progress that's been made in leaps and bounds over the past decade in prosthetics, Bolarski says he and his department still plan to aim even higher. This is something I, I like to think about is that our prosthetic technology allows people not just to return to the workforce, but perhaps someday allows them to post injury rejoin the workforce with abilities that their able-bodied colleagues may not have. So prosthetics are making their mark in the modern world, but what about artificial intelligence? Joseph Mariel, a researcher also at the U of A, says it's made bigger steps in the new millennium than most realize. The cost of getting computers, of getting the sensors, of getting the motors, of building the systems has come down dramatically. So things that used to take, um, let's say, a $100,000 robot, now might actually be commercially available. The field of artificial intelligence has yet to make headlines in most areas, generally accomplishing the same as this Raspberry Pi, which when moving around, gets a feel for the area by using its camera and its bumper turning when it hits or sees something. But the skeptics still make themselves hurt. Perry Kincaid, the former president of the Alberta Council of Technologies, does not necessarily classify as a skeptic, but he does say there's still a limit on what society is ready for technologically. When you see in Japan, for example, which is having difficulty replacing the population that's aging out, that robots are literally becoming the manufacturers. There are not jobs in manufacturing in Japan as there once were. Whether you're skeptical or excited about the advancements of robotic technology in the new millennium, all we can do is watch and wait as engineers in their labs, like the one in this building right here, attempt to advance even more the capabilities and intelligence of robotics. For Nate News Watch Extra, I'm Ben Matichuk. Some parts of the city are slowly being revitalized, bringing a different feel to the area. Our Andrew Nikolai brings us here to 124th Street to show us some of the thriving businesses and why people are drawn to come here. 124th Street has been an up-and-coming area for a number of years now. Stretching from Jasper Avenue to 111th Ave, businesses are strategically choosing the strip as their home because they recognize there is something special going on there and they want to be a part of it too. When I first came to the street, uh, the main reason pulling me to the street was um, the community. It's a very community driven street. So we get a lot of support from local businesses and the residents behind us in Glenora and Westmount. We've been open a year and a half. It's been really interesting. Um, there's been a lot, a lot of uh, restaurants that have opened up and a lot of coffee shops and the street's definitely revitalizing. We take more popcorn that we turn into a powder and then we uh, sprinkle that on top of it as well. And uh, our head chef, uh, Philippe, is the one who came up, who came up with that. Many businesses in the area have been very successful. Duchess Bake Shop in particular has seen great success and attributes it to the support that they receive from the community itself. I mean, personally, I, I love the independent nature of the street. Uh, it's one of the few areas of the city where it's not overridden with chains and franchises and things like that. Pretty much everybody on the street is an independent standalone business, which I really appreciate. The clientele that comes in here, I mean, we have an incredibly fiercely loyal community around us. 
Mm. Uh, the people who live in the general area, I mean, they are very, very proud of what 24th. Well, yeah, I mean, the streets changed tremendously in the six years that we've been here. I mean, when we opened up, there were a lot more uh, pawn shops and a lot of vacancies and things like that. In the six years that we've been opened, it's changed just night and day. Now, so many new restaurants, cafes, things like that. It's been uh, quite rewarding to see. Some people even make the pilgrimage from out of town to enjoy the sweet treats available only here. Well, there's about four or five places here we love, but uh, we came all the way from uh, Panhold, Alberta early this morning just to come here to Duchess. Because 124th has such a diverse array of shops and businesses, it attracts basically anyone who wants to be a part of the community of supporting locals, bringing out families with children and adults alike. Andrew Nikolaev. News Watch Extra. After the break, we find out what it's like to book gigs as a local band. If somebody's offering you the opening slot on a 12-band bill, take it. And we meet the faces behind well-known local blogs. Uh, they turn to blogs for a different kind of take or a different kind of opinion. Outerwear provided by Elite Sports and Innotech Inspection Solutions. Hair services by Rock Salon and Spa. There are events and then there are experiences and Trickstar Productions knows how to create both. As Edmonton's expert event planner, Trickstar knows how to bring famous personalities and artists to the capital city. Nicole Stilger tells us more. Celebrities don't phase these guys anymore. For them, it's just another day on the job. Booking celebs and planning high profile events a market you wouldn't really think exists or thrives in Edmonton. With no other company quite like this in the city, it's easy to monopolize the industry. You know, and there's people that will do the concert booking and artist booking, but they aren't really a one-stop shop like we are. They don't do, they don't go and manage the event and put on the event, you know, in person. They'll just book it and then it's on your own to do. Trickstar is a production company that has their hands in many different facets of entertainment such as event design, event management and artist management. Like most companies though, had a humble beginning. President of Trickstar Mike Anderson saw his start at Nate in 1996 and even worked for the Polytechnic for almost 11 years after graduating. Responsible for wildly successful initiatives at Nate such as Ookfest, Mike took his knack for putting on events to the next level. In 2005 he started Trickstar and in 2010 he was named as a top 40 under 40 and Trickstar was nominated for Small Business of the Year by the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce. His right-hand man, Vice President Chris Schoengut, whose post-secondary roots are also planted at Nate in digital and interactive media design, shares Mike's passion, creativity, and eye for detail, and has helped Mike bring Trickstar to where it is today. We felt Edmonton needed help with uh, bringing great, great entertainment, especially to the corporate community, and uh, you know, we took what we learned at Nate and uh, took it up a notch and, uh, you know, bringing uh, great things to the city and all, all around Western Canada. So. You may have heard of some of their clients, Jasper Tourism, Bell Media, Edmonton Eskimos. Their impressive resume is probably why River Cree hired them to be their exclusive artist management team and why people can't say enough good things about them. Mike's always known how to make things fun and he knows how to make people who attend your party have fun. He knows all the little details and every time we worked with Trickstar, whether I was with uh, Rogers or Chorus Radio or, or EMI Music, his events were always fun. While every day at the office isn't as full as, of excitement as others, they love waking up in the morning and coming to work. But who wouldn't when your day could involve a casual hangout with Chuck Liddell, MC Hammer or William Shatner? In fact, the hardest questions these guys had to answer were what events they found most memorable. Nicole Stilger, Nate Newswatch Extra. I just love live music, whether it's a hobby or a career goal. Whichever it is, scoring that first live gig in front of an audience can be a thrill for anyone. Melissa joins us with more on that story. Many Edmontonians enjoy a night out with friends. Being able to kick back, relax and have a good time while listening to the live music offered by many pubs, restaurants and bars. Not considering what that band or artist went through to land that spot playing on the stage while you listen with a drink in hand. It's a lot of work to get on that stage or in that venue. Having to create demo tapes and audition no matter how small the place is 
or how small the crowd. I sat down with Finn McCool's talent buyer and promoter to ask him what he looks for before hiring new bands or artists. Be flexible. If somebody's offering you the opening slot on a 12 band bill, take it. Take it. You never know. You know, and, and you, you can't be choosy, you know, especially at the beginning. So be honest, work hard, take any gig, and put your contact information on all of your CDs that you hand out. For any up-and-coming bands or artists hoping to break into Edmonton's music scene and get out of the garage or basement, many start by performing in smaller pubs or venues. Playing for an audience for the first time can be scary, but Pat Strain loves to interact with the smaller crowds as he thinks it makes for a good time. It's a much more uh, relaxed atmosphere. It's uh, not so much about putting on a show as it is just kind of interacting with the people and you know trying to make it a fun time. And let's be sociable. One, two, three. Sociable! Hard work and dedication to the craft can land any band or musician that dream gig. But the biggest factor is attitude and their ability to be flexible with their time. Not emailing or calling someone back who is offering a job as quick as possible can result in someone else landing that spot. The band or musician hired to play must be prepared with enough music to perform in the time they've been given and keep everyone in the room satisfied. They also have to fit the criteria for where they are playing. The talent buyer wouldn't book a punk rock band to play in a classy restaurant, so picking the right talent can be both a challenge and a reward. Melissa McLean, Nate News Watch Extra. I'm just doing some stuff for my blog. Did you know we have a lot of Edmonton bloggers in the community? No, I, I had no idea. Blogging is becoming a multi-million dollar platform. It's even become a local phenomenon as anyone can just pick up their laptop and start a business. Michaela has more. Linda Huang is an Edmonton blogger, best known for food reviews. She's been blogging for the past 10 years, but after finding her niche, she was able to gain a following. She eventually became an influencer in the community, finding people coming to her blog like they would a friend. Uh, readers or people who are Googling to see um, someone's thoughts about something, uh, they turn to blogs for a different kind of take or a different kind of opinion. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm you know, an expert writer, uh, and I certainly do not write in a way that, you know, like, big fancy words or very descriptive, that kind of thing. I just write how I would talking to someone or, you know, if I'm raving about a restaurant, I would be, I would say it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Some bloggers continue to blog on the side, but with an increase in traffic comes an increase in popular demand from companies for advertising and partnership, allowing some bloggers to turn it into a full-time gig. Janice Galloway started her local fashion blog, Dress Me Dearly, as a hobby. When she noticed her blog was receiving recognition, she was able to convert her hobby into a career. And I was just blogging about kind of things I liked and just posting photos of products I liked and sharing it with friends and family. And it was just really, you know, I, no intention was behind it. It was just for fun. Um, and then I started getting into like statistics and, and my web analytics and kind of fall. I was like, oh, I'm getting a lot of traffic and it's all mostly from kind of Edmonton, Calgary area. This is interesting. Um, and yeah, my traffic just started to grow and grow and I thought this could be a real thing. <laughs> As Janice put more effort into her blog, the more opportunities came her way. People and companies were coming to her for advice and critique, and she was able to make a name for herself in the fashion industry. Really interesting branches have happened because of the blog. So that was kind of the platform that allowed me to pursue um, these other areas of working in fashion. As her demand kept growing, so did the recognition. She won Best Edmonton Blog two years in a row. With the ever-growing popularity of blogs, it may just become a more recognizable business in years to come. Michaela Henschel, Nate Newswatch Extra. 
It's such a fun time going around the city, seeing where all the news actually came from this semester. Yeah, I had no idea Edmonton is still thriving and beautiful. I'm so glad we didn't get stung by any bees. <laughs> I think my robot still needs some work. It does. Though. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this semester in this episode of Nate News Watch Extra. Have a great summer. Thanks for watching.